AHS Delicate has finally reached its conclusion and with a completely different ending than Danielle Valentine's Delicate Condition, we've got a lot to talk about in regards to part two of the season. And be sure to stick around to the end of the video because I will be going over my favorite and least favorite changes that were made from the book to the show. Don't forget to give this video a like and let's get started. In this episode's opening scenes, we see Anna's parents, Margaret and Ned Alcott, on the very night of Anna's birth in 1988. Later, we see Anna's parents dealing with some of the troubles that come with being parents to an infant, but later Margaret complains about a pain in her leg, which Ned coldly ignores. That night, Margaret dies due to a pulmonary embolism, which was a result of Anna's birth. At the hospital following Margaret's death, we see none other than Nicolette, looking exactly how she does in the present day. Just like Ivy, Nicolette is posing as a nurse and she holds Anna and sings her her favorite lullaby. In the book, Anna's mother did not die of a pulmonary embolism when Anna was still an infant. She is said to have died in a car accident when Anna was nine. The book talks about how Anna lived with her father and a stepmother named Nora in Burbank, California, following her mother's death. And as far as I know, Anna's parents are never given any first names in the book, so the names of Margaret and Ned are definitely fabrications of the showrunner, Hallie Pfeiffer. There are nine flashbacks in the book, um, and none of them are comparable to this one in particular, as Anna's backstory is really only referenced in passing during the present day. Here's the part where I'm gonna spoil the end of the book, so again, if you do not want to hear or have a potentially large clue to how this season will end, please click away now. All right, so to put it simply, like I said, there is no comparison to this scene in the book in any way, shape, or form. Anna's mom doesn't die until Anna is nine years old. Of course, Nicolette doesn't exist in the book, but there is also no indication that anything like this ever happened to Anna when she was that young. Because essentially, the twist of the book is that the identity of who has been causing all of this chaos and confusion during Anna's pregnancy are a coven of witches who are actually trying to help Anna's pregnancy. Siobhan is a witch and a member of this coven, and she is the reason that Anna and this coven have crossed paths. Towards the very end of the book, it is explained that this coven basically just likes to help out people who are struggling to conceive or maintain healthy pregnancies, just like Anna, as a sort of public service. Throughout the book, Siobhan's friendship with Anna is emphasized. Uh, Siobhan is the only person she truly trusts for a majority of the book. So when Anna called Siobhan so emotionally after her miscarriage and begged for any way for her baby to be brought back to her, Siobhan actually conducted a powerful spell that very night that essentially resurrected Anna's baby. However, this spell is what weakened Siobhan, who again has cancer in the book. So the spell is what weakened Siobhan into the coma that she is in for the majority of the book. There is a lot more to this twist, including some other characters who are members of the coven, but I'll be touching on that in some later scenes in this episode. Now, Siobhan being a witch is definitely a big twist that still has not been outrightly said in the show, despite some heavy hints towards that being the case, but if you happen to catch the episode of the Kardashians where Kim reveals to her family that she's on AHS, she just outrightly says that Siobhan is a witch, and the editors left it in. I'm excited to play a witch. Please, let's clear eye line, just stand by. A huge spoiler that six episodes in has still not been revealed on the show. I saw clips of this being posted online when it aired, and I could not believe that they let that slip. So if you've managed to not have this spoiled, to you, honestly, congratulations, because this has been out there since the start of this show. But to put a long story short, the show is taking pieces of the book's twist, but they are definitely twisting them even further, to the point where I could not tell you how this season will end. To me, Siobhan's motives are still incredibly unclear and questionable, which again is a huge difference from the book. And the show is clearly implying that this coven of witches had their sights set on Anna as early as her infant which in the book is not the case at all as 
as the coven only gets involved with Anna's pregnancy after her miscarriage in the book. The next scene in the show picks up right where part one left off with Anna reeling from the news of Babette's sudden death. She gets a FaceTime from Siobhan and the Ashleys who are still working with her because according to Siobhan, Anna is in perpetual crisis. They tell Anna that they booked her as a speaker at Babette's funeral, which Anna is hesitant about at first, but she ends up going through with it. In the book, of course, nothing even remotely similar happens as Babette, the Ashleys, and most of this awards campaign they're all completely new plot elements that the show has introduced without any source from the book. In the show, Anna and Siobhan then make their way to Babette's funeral. Anna tells Siobhan how empowered she felt making the choice to go on that plane and go to this funeral despite her doctor's orders not to travel. Siobhan points out though that it wasn't exactly Anna's decision, but Siobhan's. Anna also takes note that her rib pain has ceased. Siobhan then reveals to Anna that she was nominated for a SAG award, but what is even more shocking is that Babette was not. Later at the funeral, Anna gives her speech and it appears to win over some awards voters in the audience. In the book, just like the last scene, there's literally no comparable scene since Babette doesn't exist and Anna spends most of the awards season hiding away in the Hamptons. One thing that is slightly similar though is uh, Anna talking about how empowered she felt disobeying her doctors, which is definitely a huge theme of the book, not exactly put in that way. In the show, when Anna gets home from the funeral, she sees that cat from a few episodes ago. She follows him outside where she sees it has chewed up the legs of another summer day doll. Anna picks up the cat and it scratches her in the face. Anna later brings the doll to the basement to add to her collection, which still includes a decaying raccoon. Still in the basement, Anna notices that a camera that she had previously seen in the basement is now missing. In the book, again, there is nothing identical to this, but uh, this scene does have a lot of elements at play that are in the book. There is a neighborhood cat in the book, um, however, it quickly gets eaten by Anna due to some of her cravings. In the next scene in the show, Dex and his father discuss Dex's mother and the trial, and Dex Dex's father is instantly insufferable. He tells Dex uh, not to testify in court. In the book, not much is said about Dex's parents other than that they live in Massachusetts. And as I've said before, this entire satanic lawsuit plot point of the season has absolutely no similarity to anything that is in the book. In the next scene in the show, uh, Nicolette shows Anna a summer day doll that she says she found on her doorstep. Then the cat interrupts them and Nicolette reveals Reveals that she is familiar with the cat and has named him Felix. Anna asks Nicolette for some privacy and then she takes the doll down to the basement and she begins to map out on her phone every location that she has found one of these dolls. And once she's done that, she draws a pentagram over the points. Yeah. In the book, there's no pentagram bullshit with the dolls, but since the magic cat is out of the bag, I might as well tell you what purpose these dolls exactly serve in the book. After Anna's pregnancy was restored by Siobhan's spell in the book, the coven began to position these dolls around Anna's home base as a sort of protection spell. And in fact, most of the horrors that Anna faces throughout the events of the book are a direct result of Anna finding these dolls and disrupting them, thus messing up the protection spell. This is what caused a lot of her hallucinations, her discomfort, and paranoia, among other things. But given how the character of Nicolette in the show is seemingly disrupting a doll herself, I think there is something different about the doll's purpose in the show that has yet to be revealed. In the show, Anna later floats in the pool and experiences what may be another hallucination where talons poke out of her stomach, much like the talons that Queen Mary's child had in episode four. Notably, the talons in the show uh, appear to leave a real mark on Anna's stomach after the fact. Later with Dex, he notices that the mark on Anna's chin is getting worse. In the book, something very similar happens to Anna in the bathtub. She experiences excruciating pain and then she hallucinates that a talon has poked through her womb. However, later on it is revealed that the poke left no mark, thus this must have been a hallucination. There is also a comparison for the mark on Anna's chin in the book. It is first introduced to us through Siobhan, who is stated to have a birthmark under her chin, which she refers to as her witch's mark. 
And since everyone who is in this cult-like coven in the show seems to have this witch's mark, it is safe to say that Anna may be a witch as well. In the book, Anna does end up joining the coven, thus she must have some sort of magical abilities. In a later scene in the show, Hamish meets Siobhan on her rooftop, where he breaks up with her and symbolically burns the script for the auteur, and he threatens to go to the press regarding the true origins of that very script. In the book, of course, there is no scene like this, considering Hamish doesn't exist and neither does Siobhan's existence as a publicist or a ghostwriter of screenplays. Later in the show, at Dex and Tanya's gallery opening, Anna asks Talia about the camera in her basement, but Talia is at first dismissive of the question altogether before claiming that she doesn't have enough interest in Anna to go through the lengths of installing and uninstalling a security camera. Then, in the bathroom, Anna has another encounter with her super fan, where essentially the same thing happens that happened in the Golden Globes episode, except this time the fan quickly regains consciousness and begins to threateningly stagger towards Anna before Anna is able to escape back into the gallery. Directly outside the bathroom, Anna comes face to face with Ivy, who, Anna insists is the same woman who did her ultrasound, despite Ivy denying this incessantly. Anna is then lured over to Sonia, who magically heals her alleged witch's mark and her cat scratches with kisses. Then Anna appears to again be in a hallucinatory trance as she sees her fan once again, and then she sees Sonia, Ivy, Nicolette, and Talia all wearing those spiky green heels from the first episode. Those four women then walk around Anna in a circle, kissing her one by one. Anna is then awoken from this trance by none other than Siobhan. In the book, shockingly, there is no comparison to the scene as Dex and Talia's business is some sort of software company and not being art dealers. However, given that the scene heavily implies that the characters of Nicolette, Sonia, Talia, and Ivy are all a part of this coven, let's take each of these characters one by one and see if they were indeed in on it in the book. Nicolette does not exist in the book, but there are house manager characters in the book, and nonetheless, they have nothing to do with the coven or what is happening to Anna in the book. And then there's Sonia, who again does not exist in the book as well. She does, however, resemble the character of Adeline in the show, and Adeline exists in the book as well. However, Adeline too has nothing at all to do with what is happening to Anna or the witches in the book. Next, Talia. Talia in the book has nothing to do with what is happening to Anna either, and she herself is not a witch. However, given that Talia too has had her own pregnancy struggles, in the book Siobhan explains that the coven had plans to one day indoctrinate Talia into the coven but throughout the course of the book, that is not the case. And lastly, Ivy, whose name is Meg in the book, is actually involved in the workings of the coven and what they were doing to try to help Anna. So out of those four people, only one of them was in on it in the book. So as you can see, the show is definitely taking its own liberties with which characters are in this coven and which are not, and I am inclined to believe that their intentions may not turn out to be as altruistic as they turned out to be in the book. And I also think that there is a possibility that there are potentially two groups at play in the show. That is not the case in the book, but potentially there could be a group of people who are trying to help Anna, and there might be a group of people that are trying to harm Anna, but we will have to wait and see if that is the case. In the next scene in the show, Anna tells Siobhan at dinner that she wants to quit acting due to all that has gone on with her stalker and the death of Babette. Siobhan slaps her across the face and brings up Anna's dead mother to convince her to keep her head in the game. Then, Hamish's death is plastered onto a nearby television screen, much to Anna's shock and much to Siobhan's disinterest. Anna then pulls out the card from a few episodes back, and she calls the number on it, only to hear a phone ringing somewhere in the restaurant. She tracks down Io Preacher, who insists that they cannot speak while Siobhan is present. In the book, nothing of the sort happens. Book Siobhan would never slap Anna. And in the last scene of the episode, Dex arrives at his mother's mansion to discover that she is dead with wounds in both of her arms. In the book, again, Dex's parents are barely characters, and they are never said to have died or anything of that sort. 
Moving on to episode 7, Ave Hestia, which was entirely flashbacks exploring Adeline's backstory. So for this episode, we are going to compare this episode's flashbacks to the nine flashback chapters that happen throughout the book, rather than comparing scene by scene, since so much of this episode is a brand new story. The episode opens in Western Europe, 45 AD, where Ivy cuts herself open to give birth to Adeline and Sonia. She is then visited by Siobhan, presumably. Then in Brooklyn in 2013, Dex gives Adeline a dog, Oz, which leads to a disagreement where he makes it clear that he does want to have kids, and Adeline is unsure. At her restaurant, Adeline sees members of the coven outside, and she later goes to a hidden room behind the kitchen, where she casts a spell. Later, she is visited by Sonia, her twin sister, who pressures her to return to the coven. Adeline refuses to go back and she refutes the coven's wicked way of influencing and using people. But Sonia says she cannot escape what she was born into. Flashing back a few centuries to 1243 in Galway, Ireland, we see Ivy being a cruel mother to both Adeline and Sonia. The family feasts on placenta while Adeline criticizes Ivy and the coven for lying to get what they need, but Ivy claims that it is for the greater good. Ivy then slams Adeline against the wall for disagreeing with her, and she spits blood onto her chin, violently coercing her into agreeance. Ivy later apologizes and gives herself and Sonia their own witch's mark to match where Ivy spit on Adeline. Back in 2013, Dex and Talia speculate about Adeline and her relationship to her family. Meanwhile, Dex Sr. gets in a heated argument with Virginia over Adeline, and he then knocks Virginia out. Talia tells Adeline that she's giving Dex a gallery since she's just sold her startup for $1.2 billion, and later Adeline is visited by Nicolette at Hestia, where she taunts Adeline with the teeth of the creatures that Adeline has birthed for the coven over the years. Then, at a nearby convenience store, Adeline's cashier is none other than Anna's bathroom superfan. Adeline later takes a pregnancy test, which is positive, much to her anguish. Dex, Adeline, Talia, and Theo have dinner at Hestia, where the infamous photo is taken that Anna is later haunted by in the Hamptons. Dex goes home while Adeline sticks at the restaurant to cast her secret spells, but at their apartment, Dex finds Adeline's positive pregnancy test, he tries to call her, but she's busy with her spells. So he tries to call his parents, but sadly, they're busy with their satanic rituals. Dex goes to his parents' house to investigate, and he ends up walking in on Virginia, being the subject of some sort of ritual at the hands of the feather-clad coven. Dex is then knocked unconscious as his father instructs the witches to erase his memory. Meanwhile, Adeline is visited by her mother, her sister, Nicolette, and a newly recruited Talia. They tell Adeline that they are going to pair Dex with a new mother who will deliver them, quote, the perfect product possible. Ivy then draws a dagger and cuts open her daughter's stomach, and the witches then cover themselves in Adeline's fluids as they douse her in gasoline and burn Adeline alive. And that is how the episode ends. And just so we are clear, none of this happens in the book remotely. In the book, the coven is never stated to be immortal, and they do their magic with the intention of helping ensure mothers have healthy pregnancies, not birth these unknown creatures. Ivy, aka Meg, is not Adeline's mother. Sonia doesn't exist in the book, neither does Nicolette. Dex's parents have no involvement with anything, and Talia was never a member of the coven in the book either. So with that being said, let me now shed some light on those nine flashback chapters that the book contains, which slowly enlightens us on the inner workings of the coven over a large span of time. Each of these flashbacks has a title that features a character's name and a year, so instead of giving you these flashbacks in the order that they appear in the book, I'm going to do them in the order that they take place chronologically. First up in chronological order is Alice Parsons' 1648, which is a chapter that details one woman's 17th century structure 
struggle that is eerily similar to Anna's own experience in the modern day. Alice Parsons is pregnant and she has a friend named Margaret. Margaret gives Alice anise seeds to help her with her pregnancy and Margaret is later tried for witchcraft and having the mark of the devil. Alice begins to experience the same kinds of hallucinations as Anna does and she also begins to find corn husk dolls all around her and she destroys the dolls. If you remember in the last episode we talked about how the dolls are a sort of protection spell and if they get moved or destroyed that's when the hallucinations and complications with your pregnancy start to arise. The next chronological flashback is Abigail Rowe 1789 but I already discussed this flashback in detail during my episode 4 book to show comparison as it does have some crucial similarities to the Queen Mary flashback. Then the next flashback is Betty Anderson 1833. Betty is deemed mad by her husband and her doctor after she gives birth when she is subjected to an intense rest cure which consists of Betty being in complete isolation. Because of these conditions, Betty believes that people are trying to steal her baby from her. Next, Judy Marshall, 1957. Judy is shocked to become pregnant at age 42 and she is very concerned with how she is going to have a healthy pregnancy. Her friend warns her that if she speaks those worries too loudly, someone might hear her and take her baby away from her. Judy dismisses this as some sort of superstition, but by the end of the chapter, Judy is approached by a stranger who claims that they can help her. The next chronological flashback chapter is Viviana Torres, 1978. Viviana is a 16-year-old in Texas when she finds out that she's pregnant. There is no legal way for Viviana to get an abortion at the time, nor would there be if she were to have this issue today, unfortunately, so Viviana turns to her friend Sofia, whose great aunt is a famous brewer from Mexico named Isabella Navarro. Sofia performs a ritual that she believes will end Viviana's pregnancy, but when the ritual is unsuccessful, Isabella comes to the rescue. Viviana also has similar hallucinations of having an animalistic baby during this chapter. Next chronologically is Io Preacher 1987, which I talk about in detail during my episode 5 book to show comparison, so be sure to check that one out if you missed it. Then there's Lucy Washington to 2007. During this flashback, Lucy and her wife Erin are shown a protection spell by their friend Josie, which consists of placing dolls in specific places as well as drinking tea and eating herbs. And the last flashback that I'll be talking about today is Raina Perkins 2018. In this chapter, Raina, a medical student, notices that she's being watched as she protests at a rally against a campus statue that is celebrating a racist surgeon. She is later approached by a woman who tells Reyna that they've been looking for people just like her, for healers. There is one more flashback chapter that is really actually a flash forward, and it serves as the epilogue for the book, so I think I'll save that one for my final book to show comparison. And now let's move on to episode 8, Little Gold Man. Last week I changed the format of these videos a little bit from taking it scene by scene to just sort of highlighting the differences between the book and the show, because as the show progresses more and more, the more it has diverged from the source material. So for this breakdown, I'll be taking it topic by topic, starting with the show's opening scene Scene, which is a flashback showing us that Mia Farrow was under Siobhan's influence during the filming of Rosemary's Baby, which has absolutely no similarities to anything in the book. None of the flashbacks in the book actually have any connection to Hollywood, as you would know if you watched last week's book to show comparison, since in that breakdown I discussed every single flashback chapter in the book. Another thing with no book similarities in this episode was Virginia's funeral, as Dex's parents again have relatively no impact or role in the story of the book, and neither one of them dies. And as for Io Preacher, she doesn't have any sort of public outburst like she does at Virginia's funeral in the show. The next topic I'll be talking about is the twist that gave everyone whiplash since it came out of nowhere in the middle of this episode. The twist in the show is that Cora, the receptionist at Dr. Hill's office, has been secretly in an affair with Dex, and she's also the one who has been breaking into the apartment and messing with Anna's calendars, appointments, 
and medications. Her motive for doing all of this in the show? Well, it's because Cora is jealous of Anna, Anna after Dex breaks up with her, and during the opening scene of the entire season when an intruder climbs into bed with Anna, well, it turns out that that was Cora being a full-on creep after her breakup with Dex. In the book, though, the twist is pretty similar, but it has some notable differences. Cora reveals the cheating revelation to Anna over the phone, and she says that Dex was planning to leave Anna after that last round of IVF that they were doing at the beginning of the story. Cora says that as she saw Anna continually going in and out of the clinic, she began to feel worse and worse about the situation, and so the night when Cora climbed into Anna's bed, she had mistaken Anna for Dex, and she claimed she was there that night to break up with Dex. Anna hangs up the phone call and doesn't really grill Cora for any more details. Later, Dex accuses Cora of lying about her being the one who broke things off, and of quote, going crazy, after Dex says he was the one who broke up with her. But Anna doesn't believe Dex in this moment, and rereading the confession of Cora Cora, you could interpret it either way, she could be lying, she could be telling the truth, but in the book, when I read it the first time, I sort of sided with Anna and believed Cora's side of the story, but the show obviously depicts something more along the lines that is Dex's side of the story. And there are two details in the book that made their way into the show that I feel are a bit confusing in the show, and one is that they kept the part where Cora says baby to Anna during the bed scene, even though in the show Cora is not mistaking Anna for Dex, and the second detail is that they kept the part where Dex leaves the apartment wearing Anna's hat, which in the book causes Cora to think that it is Anna who left the apartment. But in the show, having Dex wearing Anna's hat serves no real purpose, despite in the book having a clear setup and payoff between the initial intruders chapter and the chapter where Anna finds out the truth. In the show, after Anna finds out about this, she confronts Dex about his cheating and she kicks him out in a very brief exchange. In the book though, after confronting Dex about Cora, she realizes that the reason why Dex has always been so cagey about Adeline, his ex-wife, was because he cheated on her when she couldn't have a child, just like Dex was doing to Anna at this moment. It is also revealed here in the book that Cora was not the last person that Dex cheated on Anna with. The chapter really highlights how Dex was truly responsible for a lot of Anna's paranoia throughout the book, since he likely knew that it was Cora who spooked Anna that night, and it was her who continually broke in and messed with Anna's stuff, and he didn't tell Anna any of this and let her believe she was going crazy or being stalked and targeted just to protect his own secret. In the book, Anna leaves Dex after this confrontation, and this is the moment that Anna goes into labor. In the show though, of course, Anna begins to go into labor at the Oscars, where Siobhan does some unclear magic, and Anna ends up winning Best Actress before having to be escorted off the stage to be transported straight to the hospital. Another difference between this episode and the book is this Oscars moment, as in the book, Anna does lose her category at the Oscars, and she doesn't even attend the ceremony after she experiences an episode where she sees Meg in the Hamptons and she passes out. And so for the sake of a healthy pregnancy, she chooses not to travel to the Oscars. Like I've said this entire time, the book really lets the awards campaign take the back seat in the last half of the book as Anna becomes increasingly paranoid and devoted to ensuring she has a healthy pregnancy. In the book's epilogue though, it is stated that Anna continues her acting career and she does eventually win an Oscar. Lastly, let's talk about Dr. Hill and his his relationship to the coven of witches. In the show, Cora suspects that the coven lures patients into his office, and when the time comes for Dr. Hill to oversee his patients' births, he partakes in some sort of ritual that Cora says changes him. We'll have to wait and see if Cora's guess is close to the truth in the final episode, but in the book, Dr. Hill is not as evil as the book makes her out to be, as again, Dr. Hill is a woman in the book, and she is sort of the middleman for the coven as she finds them struggling mothers to be like Anna for the coven to then help. But it's clear with the show having a much different history of this coven and a seemingly more sinister motive behind what they're doing, it's very clear that they're doing something completely different with both the coven and Dr. Hill's role in it, but there is obviously still a chance that they could flip the script. All right, let's move on to the season finale of AHS Delicate entitled The Auteur. 
Like the past couple of comparisons, we won't take it scene by scene, instead I'll be taking it topic by topic. First, let's talk about the birth of Anna's baby. In the show, uh, Anna goes into labor at the Oscars, and she is then taken into an ambulance driven by none other than Ivy, who takes her down to some warehouse. Ivy kills Kamal in the ambulance, Dex tries to help Anna while en route, but his hand gets severed by the baby still inside Anna's womb. Ivy then kills Dex by shoving his own hand down his throat. In the warehouse, the rest of the witches ritualistically deliver Anna's baby, who ends up being one of those clawed creatures that we've seen the hand of sporadically throughout the season. When Anna asks to hold her baby, Siobhan tells her that she gave up her baby for her Oscar and her child now belongs to the coven. In the book though, Anna goes into labor directly after confronting Dex about his cheating with Cora, and at this point Anna trusts nobody, not Dex, and not Dr. Hill. So she calls Olympia, a character who was completely scrapped in the show. Olympia runs what Anna knows to be a natural birthing center that Siobhan suggests to Anna early on in the book, but this birthing center actually turns out to be the coven that seeks out struggling moms-to-be in order to help them have successful pregnancies. In the book, Anna tells Olympia to come get her, and eventually a car pulls up to the Hamptons house, who Anna believes is Olympia. Turns out though, it's actually Cora, who apparently has more to tell Anna, but Anna had blocked her number. Cora spews her own personal conspiracy theories about Anna's baby and Dr. Hill, which does not turn out to be true in the slightest. The book continues as Anna's contractions get worse, and Dex ends up driving Anna to the hospital in a rainstorm, and on the way, Anna bites Dex's ring finger, breaking it, and simultaneously removing Dex's wedding ring. This combined with the wet road conditions causes a car wreck that kills Dex. Then in the book, Siobhan and the coven arrive on the scene to help Anna, and Siobhan reveals almost everything to Anna. It was Siobhan and the other members of the coven that had been watching Anna while wearing those sunglasses and the blue baseball hat. Later, Anna is taken to the hospital where she reunites with the sexist ER doctor from earlier in the book, Dr. Crawford, who helps Anna deliver her baby, which turns out to be a normal, healthy human girl. And just as Anna's baby was born, Siobhan passes away in the book. A couple days later, Olympia visits Anna in the hospital, and Olympia reveals to Anna that Siobhan had approached Olympia a while ago to help Anna conceive. And then the night that Anna miscarried, Olympia sent Meg to give Anna an ultrasound to see if there was anything that they could do to help, but they were too late. However, when Anna called Siobhan that night and begged her for any way to bring her baby back, Siobhan conducted a spell that resurrected Anna's baby. But given Siobhan's cancer, this powerful spell weakened her to a comatose state. After this, the coven began to hide the dolls around Anna in the in the Hamptons as a protection spell for her baby, but when Anna began to find these dolls and move them, that messed up the spell and what and that was also what caused all of her hallucinations and her paranoia. Then Olympia undoes a memory spell that she had put on Anna the night that she gave birth, and as she does this, Anna remembers what exactly happened the night she gave birth to her daughter. Before the baby was born, Siobhan told Anna that she was dying, but that women in her coven can have a second chance at life by creating a new body for themselves within the womb of another, with that person's consent. Siobhan tells Anna that she's already completed this process herself multiple times in the past, but it was never her intention to ask Anna to do this. But that is now where she finds herself. Siobhan also extends an invite to for Anna to join the coven, and Anna ends up agreeing to both of Siobhan's propositions in the book. Back to the show, it all ends with Adeline's ghost visiting Anna, and the pair begin chanting to Hestia as Siobhan returns to the room. Adeline and Anna's chanting causes Siobhan to disintegrate and die. The chanting also transforms Anna's baby from one of those creatures to a normal human baby. Anna then puts on Siobhan's headpiece while holding her baby and her Oscar, and the rest of the coven's chants can be heard off screen. The book ends with a flash forward chapter titled Lena Kane Many Many Years Later. In this chapter, Lena Kane, a woman with polycystic ovarian syndrome, visits an IVF support group, and at this meeting, Lena meets a much older Anna Victoria Alcott, who Lena instantly recognizes as an Academy Award winner. So, although Anna did not 
win her Oscar for the auteur in the book. She does end up winning an Oscar later on in her career. At this point in the future, Anna's daughter, Siobhan Alcott, is now old enough to be pursuing her own acting career, which is exactly what she's doing. Anna, too, is still working in the business as she states that she's working on a film about infertility. The book ends with Anna helping Lena, just how Siobhan had helped Anna at the beginning of the book. So those are the major differences between the ending of the show and the ending of the book. Some small notes being Kamal survives in the book as well, as do all of the witches aside from Siobhan, who of course is reincarnated as Anna's daughter. The episode also reveals that Preacher's first name in the show is Mavis and not Io, like it is in the book. Alright, with the episode 9 comparisons out of the way, I now want to circle back to what I think are some of the best and the worst changes that the show made from the book. Let's start with the best changes, the first of which is the characters of the Ashleys. The Ashleys have no similarities to any characters in the book, but in their sporadic appearances throughout the show, these two injected some of my favorite moments of the season, largely thanks to the comedic delivery and timing of both Billy Lord and Leslie Grossman. Of course, I do think they were very underutilized in part two of the season. They really only got one major scene of dialogue, and yeah, I would have loved to see more of them, but what was there of them was definitely a welcome addition to the show. Next, Adeline and Sonia were also very welcome changes in the show. Of course, in the book, Adeline is Dex's very living ex-wife who he similarly cheated on before he began his relationship with Anna. Adeline is not a witch in the book, she doesn't own any restaurant, and she doesn't have an evil twin, so the show's complete alteration of this character's backstory led to a lot of my favorite moments moments in the season, and uh, some of my favorite characters in Sonia and Adeline, and of course it also led to my favorite episode of the season, Ave Hestia, which somehow gave us more depth into Adeline's character than we got from Anna all season long. Nicolette, too, is a character that has no book counterpart, and while I do think she was similarly underutilized, there is no doubt that Nicolette and Michaela J. Rodriguez added a lot to this season, especially in the part two section, but in part one, she is introduced a little late for my likings, and she has very little screen time for a majority of the season. So despite Michaela J. Rodriguez being the main reason I was tuning into this season, the character of Nicolette did leave a lot to be desired. But again, much like the Ashleys, I do wish she was used more, but what she was used for, I did appreciate, and I'm glad they added those elements to the season that weren't in the book. Next, I think the show's flashbacks were a great improvement from the book. The book's flashback chapters were great, don't get me wrong, but they're all fairly brief and they are largely unresolved, since they really only serve the purpose to sort of steer the reader's train of thought. The show takes a completely different angle from the book and uses its flashbacks to flesh out the history of this evil and immortal coven, and, and while we still have unanswered questions, the flashbacks throughout the season and in episode 7 were definitely huge highlights of the season that gave us a break from the perspective of the unreliable protagonist that we followed for so much of the season. The character of Virginia is another change that I think served the show very well, as Dex's parents are only briefly mentioned in the book and they have nothing to do with the plot of the story, and all of the show's scenes regarding Virginia and Dex Sr.'s lawsuit and satanic rituals were created solely for the show. And this conflict was strong in the middle of the season, although it did fizzle out like a lot of the other plot points in the show unsatisfyingly towards the end, but nonetheless I am glad that this part of the story was included. Now for the worst changes, starting with Siobhan, as we know in the book Siobhan is not a publicist but instead an actress who is Anna's best friend. In the book she always has Anna's best interests, she literally is the reason Anna is pregnant to begin with, and she also saved Anna's pregnancy after she miscarried. Siobhan's presence in the book is also not nearly as heavy handed as it is in the show because, like I've said, she is in a coma for the middle portion of the book. The show ended up merging Siobhan with the publicist character of Emily from the book, and they removed her coma, and of course it also changed her from a good witch to a wicked one. But what the show failed to do is portray Siobhan as a true confident, confidant or friend of Anna's, and this made the evil twist on her character pretty underwhelming. And that is not even mentioning how this 
version of Siobhan is defeated so easily in the show, which, like I said in my review, is just the cop-out of all cop-outs. The ending aside though, this character in the show is not nearly fleshed out enough given her thousands of years of history, and Siobhan ended up just being a big letdown for me. Speaking of the ending, I also think that was one of the worst changes that they made, and the effects of this change had many ramifications on the season as a whole. So instead of the witches being revealed to be a force for good like they are in the book, they are revealed to be gaslighting women like Anna in order to breed some ill-defined, demented creatures. Yet, just like in the book, the show still ends up giving Anna a human baby. But because they put us through all of the satanic rituals and the Talon babies, Anna getting that human baby felt very unearned, especially when all it took was about 20 seconds of chanting to solve all of Anna's problems and defeat a 2,000 year old coven and simultaneously change the species of her baby. The book's ending isn't perfect and definitely wouldn't have translated perfectly to the show if they just did it exactly how it happened, but what we ended up getting felt like an underdeveloped hybrid of both the book's ending and the ending that the show seemed to be pushing from the get-go. Aside from those larger changes, I also felt like the show changed a lot of unnecessary things that didn't end up serving the show at all. The Korra twist was botched in translation just like the stupid photo gimmick that they kept going back to in those early episodes. The dolls never got a true explanation in the show, and for some godforsaken reason, the show changed Io Preacher's name to Mavis Preacher. And there you have it, once again, those are all of the similarities and differences between American Horror Story Delicate and Delicate Condition by Danielle Valentine. If you have not read the book yourself, definitely check it out because there is still a plethora of information and details that I could not cover in these videos, and it's genuinely a really fun and quick read to any of you who are interested. And spoiler alert, I did like the book better than the show when all is said and done. Let me know all of your thoughts on the season in the comments below, and if you've read the book, let me know which you liked better, Delicate Condition or AHS Delicate. Give this video a like if you've made it this far, subscribe for more horror content, and I will see you next time.